Good morning and happy Sabbath, Village family. Good morning. What a wonderful week it has been. I, I just have to say, and next week is looking just as good, if not better. Uh, for those of you who are looking ahead, there is sunshine. Everything is still green, though. I am seeing the leaves start to change color in a few places, and I'm praying that God will prolong the time so that we can enjoy this beautiful season just a little bit longer. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you this morning, as well as those who are tuning in online, those who may be visiting for the first time, either online or in person, a very warm welcome to you this morning. There are quite a few announcements, so if you want to, get your pens ready for a lot of the information that's going to be coming out. Prayer meeting is continuing on Wednesdays at 6.20, both in person and mm. online. We will be changing the format of how we're doing prayer meeting very, very soon, so you do not want to miss out. Items for the second shipping container bound for El Salvador are stacking up. If you have anything large to bring, that's okay, but make sure that you check with the church office first. Uh, give us a call, send an email to Tony, and uh, find out if the item can fit and what time we can arrange for you to come and uh, make sure that you do that before you bring it, otherwise you will have to take it back with you. Uh, the necessary village school renovations are wrapped up now. We really need to wrap up the fundraiser for it as well. You can see the thermometers here on your uh, screens and also on the digital bulletin, uh, which was handed out. You can have this information. Make sure that as you give to the remodel or the renovations that you mark on the tithe envelope that this is for VAES remodel or renovation so that the church treasurer knows exactly which fund to put it in. Otherwise, if you just label it VAES, then it goes to just the general fund for the school. So make sure to do that. Pathfinders are starting up with registration and orientation night this Tuesday at 6.30 in the evening. So Tuesday at 6.30 in the evening, uh, come and learn what Pathfinders will be doing to social distance and carry out a great year of learning and growth. And if you have any friends who are interested in being part of Pathfinders, there's a lot of new families that are moving in uh, right now because school is about to begin on Monday. And so make them aware of what is going on here at Village and let them know that at Tuesday at 6.30 in the evening, they can come and find out more information. The children's Sabbath school class promotion is next Sabbath. This is where the children go from, I'm not exactly sure what the divisions are, but like from primary to early teen, or maybe I'm missing a gap, but this is where they get promoted to the next class depending on their ages. So please make sure to bring your child next week to... Uh, the Sabbath school classes for the promotion services. September 6 through 13 is our annual church trip, which is canoeing in the boundary waters of Minnesota. If you would like to know more about the trip, please contact the church office this week for details and preferably before Wednesday. I'm not exactly sure what time on Wednesday, but I believe that uh, an email I got on Wednesday, there was going to be an orientation for the trip. So Please contact the office as soon as possible if you're interested in coming or if you have friends who are interested. This is September 6 through 13. Fred Sharla, or Sharla, former member and village school board chair, passed away this week at age 86. No service has been planned at this time. And also Joanne Habenicht went to a rest on Thursday morning. No services are planned at this time, but please keep these families in your prayers. Tonight at seven o'clock, there is the annual prayer walk which is taking place at the village school. There are many things to pray about and this is also a great opportunity for you all to come and see all the different renovations and, and the remodel which has been done at the school and how much of a lift and what a beautiful atmosphere is going to be present there for the children as they come and as they begin to study and learn more about the world and also about their loving Savior. So please note the time is 7 p.m. tonight at the Village School uh, Gymnasium. That's where we will meet and then we will go around and we'll pray in the different classrooms in smaller groups and there will be social distancing. This is a great uh, opportunity to bring your entire families. This isn't just for those who are older but also for young ones as well. And again, a great way to see the school. I wish you many blessings and let's prepare our hearts now as we transition to worshiping.
Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Dear Lord, I ask you to please bless and guide our service today. Help us to receive a real blessing. Thank you, Lord. Please remain standing for opening song. Happy Sabbath. For this morning's children's story, I actually have two stories. One is about myself, and one is about a friend of mine. Um, the, so I'll start with the one about myself. When I was in the Marine Corps, um, we went to many schools. And one of the schools I went to was the first picture, uh, jump school or airborne training in Fort Benning, Georgia. And that school, um, you were there for three work weeks and you learned how to... Okay, 
No problem. So you're going to have pictureless story today. Sorry, sorry, kids. <laughs> You'll have to uh, listen the old-fashioned way and use your imaginations. Okay. So um, the pictures that I was going to show you was Fort Benning, Georgia. So imagine this in your mind, which sometimes give us the best pictures anyways. Um, these 250-foot high towers with parachutes on them. And that's, after you did ground training in that school, that's what you did. You went up and they, it, was, it was actually an old carnival ride. It was at some place and, and they didn't use them anymore, so the army bought them and they used them to train parachutists. So they would take you up 250 feet and then they would drop you. And that's the first way you would uh, learn how to parachute. So some of you are probably saying, why would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? And that's a very good question. And, and there is a reason. It, it may not sound so sound to you, but sometimes pair, uh, planes and helicopters cannot land certain places that we needed to go. So obviously, the quickest down, way uh, to some place when you're up is to come down. And so we would jump out of planes or helicopters uh, in order to do that. Never jumped out of a balloon. That's one thing I haven't done. So um, after you went through the training, after three weeks, you went and jumped out of airplanes. And the next picture was a picture of us jumping out of planes. And that was what they would call static line. And that's, if you've ever seen any movies or, or depictions of military people, that's mostly what people see. You hook up a line and to a cable, and you actually just jump out the door, or you jump out the ramp, depending on what kind of plane, or if you're in a helicopter, you just jump off the side of the helicopter. Um, the funnest one that we had was when I was in the Marine Corps and actually was with my unit in Force Recon, is they had an OV-10, which was a twin engine plane, and they would fly right along, this might not sound too much fun to you, but it was a, we loved it. You, you fly over the forest or the, the trees, and then you pop up, and then you're in the back of this little plane, and it was like the ultimate carnival ride. And then you just pull the, pull the seat belt and you just pop out, woo, and you jump out. So I went to that school and I, I got my five jumps. And then in the Marine Corps, when you get 10 jumps, then you get another, you get your gold wings. <clears throat> and then I, God just blessed me when I was in the Marine Corps to be able to go to many schools. I spent probably half the time I was in the service in schools. And in this school, I, I learned how to free fall. And that's the one that many of you have probably seen with, with parachutists. They, you jump out of a plane, you don't, there's no static line to pull your chute, and you fall for a long time. So you're falling at 120 miles an hour until you come to deployment altitude, which is usually about 3,000 feet. And at 3,000 feet, you pull your parachute, and if all works out well, you descend, and then you flare your chute, and then you can just like almost tiptoe to the ground. So when everything works out really well, that's how things go. And um, the picture I was going to show you is a picture of us jumping out of a, a C-130 or a C-141, which are the military jets that people get transported in. And these are the jets or planes that you would jump out of. <clears throat> Usually when we were training, we jumped from 10,000 feet which sounds pretty high, but actually for the things that we were doing, what we were training for was to jump from 25 to 30,000 feet. Anybody know what you need when you go up that high? Oxygen. So we would have to jump on oxygen, and we'd learn how to do that, and you'd jump out on oxygen, and then you'd get under your chute, and then you'd fly to wherever you had to go, and then go do the business you had to do. So that's what I learned how to do. And everything was going well. I went through training. Um, the first, when you do your military free fall training, one of the things you learn, uh, and I think they've changed it, but at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, right over there in Ohio, they used to have a wind tunnel. And so that, that is where you would learn how to get what they call flat and stable, like this. And my granddaughter the other day, you know how babies lie in their bellies? And I think she was training for military free fall because she was going, Wah. <laughs> That's how I, that's, that's how a grandfather in the Marine Corps sees it. <laughs> so anyways, the, the training that I received was very good, and I went to my unit 
uh, second forest reconnaissance company, and we were jumping, and the difference was we were jumping on equipment that <clears throat> I'd never jumped before. And so we were jumping out of a helicopter, CH-46, and we were at 10,000 feet, we jump out, everything's good. And I remember very clearly, uh, Sergeant Howell, who was another guy in my unit, came over and he did what's called pinning. And that's when you're flying along and someone comes up to you and they touch your hand and you can fly together. Now that sounds very easy, but at 120 miles an hour, anything is not very, everything you do is, is like just the minutest thing. If I went like this, I'd go flying over this way. Or if I go like this, I'm going flying over this way. So any little movement of your body and all, this thing, all of a sudden, the next thing you notice, you're not flying the way you're supposed to. Because what you're supposed to do is fly face to the ground. Because if you don't fly that way, and you'll hear this in a second, <laughs> problems develop. <laughs> so anyway, Sergeant Howell came over. He, he touched me, you know, what we call um, pinning. And then we flew together. And then he took off because he had much more experience than I did. So we're flying through the air. So now you gotta imagine dropping through the sky at 120 miles an hour, and the ground comes up pretty fast. So everything was normal, and I looked at my altimeter, and that's what you do, you check your altimeter to see how high you are, because you really don't wanna pull lower than 3,000 feet. Because if you have any problems, then that's when you get into trouble. So at 3,000 feet, I, I looked at my altimeter, I said, good to go, and I went like this, and nothing happened. <laughs> and because in, the, in uh, Halo School in Fort Bragg, we had these things called pull, they're like little chutes, and you pull those out, and they deploy your, your, um, pot, your parachute. But at the company, they had the old-fashioned Rip cords, you've probably heard about those. And mine went about this far and it stopped. Well, come to find out, it wasn't the parachute's problem, it was my problem because I'd never jumped one of those and I just needed to pull on it real hard and I didn't. But when I did that, remember I told you every little thing, makes, I started to roll and started to tumble through the sky. And the problem when you're falling at that fast is you think everything seems to go really fast it seems to go really slow. So when you're, imagine you're traveling 120 miles an hour, like I said, that ground's coming up very quickly. And I know people would say, oh, it was your training. It was just what you had been told. It was your experience. But I know, I heard a voice in my head that after I'd uh, tumbled for a while, and it, it's like this, it's like sky, ground, sky, ground, sky, ground, and that's not a good, that's not a good feeling, <laughs> because you know you're supposed to be looking at the ground, so when you pull your parachute, everything comes out right, because if you're seeing sky, ground, sky, ground, sky, ground, and you pull your parachute, you can get wrapped up in your parachute, and then if you guys know anything about physics, you know, the reason a parachute works, it's able to catch the air. If it's wrapped around you, it doesn't work. <laughs> so finally, I know I heard a voice. Whether it was audible or not, I'm not sure. But it said, Mark, get on your back right now and pull your reserve. And now what's funny about that is I knew to pull my reserve, and they had trained me to get on my back. And the way you do that is you arch your back real hard. And no matter what you're doing, eventually you'll, you'll either come out like this or you'll come out like that. And so I did that. Um, and I came out flat, and I immediately pulled my reserve. And the next thing I knew, I was in the trees. <laughs> so that's not good. <laughs> and I didn't realize how close I was until I landed in the trees, and I'm hanging there by my parachute, and uh, some guys ran up to me, and they said, we thought you were dead. <laughs> and that is not a good feeling <laughs> when somebody runs up to you and says, we thought you were dead. <laughs> except that I was alive, so that was a good feeling. So that story right there, I was not, I was a Christian, but I was not walking close to the Lord at that time. And I think what, that was one of the things the Lord really used to wake me up and say, I'm still here, I'm still caring for you, and you still need to listen to me. And so that was actually one of those events in my life 
that helped lead me back to Christ. The other one I want to tell you about is a pastor named Dwight Taylor. Not Dwight Nelson, Dwight Taylor. And Dwight Taylor um, was a missionary in Peru to, in the Amazonian jungle. And the way I know Dwight Taylor is at Berkshire Hills Church, where I was from, we had a mission. We went on over a dozen mission trips um, to places like Honduras and Chile and Guatemala and El Salvador. No, we didn't go to El Salvador. We went to uh, Dominican Republic and Mexico and Guanaja, which is an island in, in, in Honduras. We went on all these mission trips, and very often Dwight, Pastor Dwight was one of our uh, members on our trips, and it, of course he spoke Spanish, so that was an added bonus, but he was a super hard worker. And he always told the story, and we made sure he told that on every mission trip, about when he was a missionary in Peru, and he hadn't been there that long, I don't believe, because they were just establishing the work, and they were on the river there, and they had a little compound. And as is the case in many times, unfortunately, when Christians come into some of these areas, they're not always well received. And it was like that here. Now, he had some people that were already accepting Christ and wanting to come, but they were a very small group of people. And some of these people knew the villagers around them, and they would tell Dwight, they are not happy with the Christians being here. In fact, <clears throat> Pastor Dwight had to go away, and as is the case in many of those places, when you're on the uh, Amazon River or in any of these jungle areas, the river was the main highway. So Pastor Dwight <clears throat> told his wife, and uh, I'm not sure if he had, he had ended up having like five kids, I don't know how many of them were, were born by that time, but it was just a small group of people in a little compound there in the Peruvian Amazon jungle. Um, and they might have had a fence around the compound, but that's it. They didn't have any security. They certainly didn't have any armed guards or anything like that. It was just very, what we would consider primitive today. Um, and so Pastor Dwight went away, and before he went away, of course, they all prayed. And when we go on a trip, what do we do? We, oh, there it is. <laughs> we got the pictures. Yeah, that's, that's not a picture of him, but that is a picture of what it might have looked like. Yeah, we, we pray, right? And so um, they prayed. Pastor Dwight went about his business. And that day, some of the Christian um, Amazonian people, the Peruvian people, came in, and they said to Dwight's uh, wife, they said, there are people here that are coming and they said, we are going to kill everybody in that compound because they're Christians and we don't like them and we want to get rid of them. So they didn't know what to do. They didn't have any security. They didn't have any guards. So, of course, they prayed. And I think they spent all night in prayer because they were supposed to be coming that night. Well, that could be the end of my story <laughs> because nothing happened. So that night, they woke up, I mean, after that night, they, they either got up from their prayer, or if they got any sleep at all, they woke up, and uh, time went by, Pastor Dwight comes back, and life goes on as normal, until he meets one of those gentlemen that was leading this group of people to attack the village, because he was doing his missionary work, and I don't know all the details, but somehow he came into contact with this man, <clears throat> and he knew he was opposed to him. He knew he was against Christians and, and people who were teaching about Jesus, and it, he came up to him. He said, I want to learn about Jesus, and Pastor Dwight looked at him and said, okay, and started talking with him, and he said, but first, I want to know where you were able to hire the armor, the army of men in silver armor that surrounded your, your compound. And Pastor Dwight is like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he said, uh, we came the night you left to kill everyone in that compound. And we were ready to do it. Um, they had drank the local drink, and so they were, you know, high on whatever they were high on. And they were ready to kill everybody in there. And he said, we approached the compound, 
and there was a ring of silver-clad uh, armored soldiers around the compound. And uh, every time Pastor Dwight told that story, he would cry. Because he knew if it wasn't for those angels, his family wouldn't be alive today. So I have a verse for you, if it comes up. <laughs> and if it doesn't come up, I still have it for you. <laughs> it's Psalms 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. So, uh, boys and girls, uh, today you can trust God to send his angels to take care of you. And you just need to put your life in his hands. Uh, as Pastor Dwight did when he trusted his family uh, to God and he sent the angels to protect them. The other verse I want to share real quickly is the one, it's not on the slide, but it talks about how when the angels will keep your foot from dashing a stone. Obviously, from my first story, that one has a special place in my heart. Whatever it is, God has his angels, and he is actively involved in taking care of us. Let's pray. Father God, uh, whether it's COVID or people who are opposed to knowing about Jesus and will do anything to to keep quiet those who, who won't stop talking about him. Or whatever it is in our life, Lord, that makes us afraid. Lord, you give us fear in some senses because it's good to be afraid of those things that would hurt us and we need to keep away from. But in other ways, Lord, you want us to trust you. You want us to trust no matter what the circumstance is, that you can take care of us, that your angels will be around us, and we can call on you and help us, Lord, to trust you and to call on you often. In Jesus' name, amen. Mr. Bugby's story about the parachute reminds me of the smile that is running around the internet right now. His parachute didn't open and the cause of death was determined to be COVID-19. That's a joke. <laughs> it's a problematic proverb. It originated in Greek philosophy, and Benjamin Franklin, who was not a Christian theologian, popularized it in American culture. You know it well. The Lord helps those who help themselves. A survey was done by the Barna Group. 75% of Americans believe that the Bible teaches that proverb as it is stated. 75% of American teenagers believe that it was the central teaching of the Bible. The Lord helps those who help themselves. There is a lot of biblical illiteracy out there. In the same way, perhaps, that there's a lot of other confusion on other subjects, and I don't want to get too far off the point, but a survey was done a couple of weeks ago that indicated that Americans believed when it came when they were asked what percentage of Americans have died of COVID, the average answer was 9%. The average answer that Americans give for how many people have died of COVID is 9%. That's 30 million Americans. That's what we believe apparently. Of course, the answer is not 9%, it's not 4%, it's not 1%, it's not one-tenth of 1%, one it's four one-hundredths of 1%, one not 30 million. When the survey was done a couple weeks ago, it was 150,000 Americans had died of COVID. Such is the state of biblical uh, illiteracy and misunderstanding about other things around us. 
But on the matter of that problematic proverb, we can correct it by changing one word. The Lord helps those who help others. That is solidly biblical. Our offering this morning is for Michigan Advanced Partners. As you know, that is an offering program instituted by this conference and administered by lay people in this conference that is specifically designed for people, members in one congregation, to help others, very often in other Adventist congregations or in other initiatives that the conference would like to do. It might mean a new roof for a small church in Muskegon or, or a, a parking lot or an addition to a school or something at Camp Osabo. But the offering specifically appeals to us, to that uh, nature within us, to remind us that the Lord helps those who help others. This church has fully embraced the understanding of that proverb and has fully embraced Michigan Advance Partners because this congregation, uh, according to the report that Paul Palandini just gave me this week regarding the MAP offerings for the first half of this year, this church leads all other churches in the Michigan Conference in its contribution to Michigan Advance Partners. We believe in helping others. Amen. Stacy Gusky is the chair of the Village Adventist Elementary School Board. And MAP offerings has specific relationship to what we are doing in the renovation of the Village Adventist Elementary School. And so Stacy, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about that. When we were working on a plan for developing finances for the remodel at the school, um, it was brought to my attention that MAP does help schools. In fact, in 2000, MAP helped build the music wing that we have on our school, which has benefited hundreds of students and it's benefited all the church areas, churches and our church as well, through music instruction and performance. And so, as the summer started, I sent out an application for MAP, and it, it kind of turned out that some people on the MAP board didn't really realize the same thing, that schools weren't something that could benefit. And through research and careful reading, we discovered that yes, schools do get benefits from MAP, and so we did apply. We have received everything we asked for, which is rare. Usually, you apply and they give you a percentage of what you've applied for. And that amount of money will be reflected in our thermometer hopefully next week once we receive the check. So thank you for being diligent in your offerings to MAP because how much a church gives is reflected in how much that they're able to give back to us. So Stacy, um, I'm understanding that you're not going to tell us exactly what that amount is, is that correct? I'm a big believer in you don't have it until it's in your hand. Oh, you do, okay. <laughs> All right, so respecting your understanding that it's not appropriate to announce today how much we received from MAP, you have told us, I believe, that we received everything we asked for. Yes. So respecting the limitation on information, could you at least tell us how much we asked for? <laughs> <laughs> nice try. We'll see you next week. Be back next week when we understand that the thermometer goal device that is on the back of the bulletin regarding the renovation at the Village Adventist Elementary School should have a noticeable change. Uh, whether you see that in the digital version online or whether you are blessed to receive a paper copy when you come here. That's what MAP does. And our participation when we return 1% of our income, that's 10% of what we give for tithe to Michigan Advanced Partners, blesses others around this conference in remarkable ways, and the Lord makes sure that he fulfills that proverb, the Lord helps those who help others. Our Savior put it more specifically, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put in your lap.
Our Father in heaven, we praise you for the opportunity to give. But more importantly, we praise you for what you have given to us, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, we're gonna have a short video about the progress of the work happening over at the village school, a little bit about the work bee, and a little bit about the uh, pouring of the concrete out front. So enjoy that video, and then I'll speak to that in just a moment after that. Thank you. So today is our grand work bee for the school, and we've had over 45 people show up to help, so thank you all very, very much. We've cleaned, we're painting, we're weeding, we're hanging bulletin boards, we're decorating, and it's just been an awesome experience to have everybody here to help us out get the school ready for the beginning of school, August 31. Still quite a bit to be done, but the gym, if you look behind me, is now being painted. Uh, the classrooms are being reorganized and, re and cleaned. The cabinets have been repainted and new doors and new fixtures put on those. Uh, new carpets are being laid in the grades seven and eight. Myrna and I were doing the window sills and wiping off all the flat surfaces in several of the classrooms. And when we, th and we did the desks, uh, so I spent a lot of time riveting, drilling things into the wall, everything like that. Um, and I came here today to um, really because I wanted to wanted to lend a hand back to the church. To, you know, there's been so many different things. God's blessed me in so many, many different ways. You know, I feel like this is where I need to be, where I need to be helping with. I want to help advance the mission. And if this is the only way I can do it right now, then this is how I'm going to do it. I came today to help clean up the floors from all the paint that was on the floors. The reason we came is because my kids are going to be here this year. Um, they are in first and fifth grade, and so we wanted them to get a sense of community involvement and also so that they can get to know the teachers and the school and the people around them. I showed up today because this is our school and I'm so excited to help in this transformation of it. I got put in charge of painting, um, so that means I will have to close my eyes while I walk down certain hallways. And the atmosphere and just the spirit of everyone was they were so hardworking and so sweet and helpful if there was ever a, a down moment they would find more work to do and so it has just been a privilege and an encouragement to me to be here um, and see how many people are supporting what I do every day. Pastor Andy, Mike, my son Sam and um, Phil and between all that we were able to get the lockers done. We uh put them on, we took them off, we put them on again, we took them off again, we put them on, but you know, details do matter and uh, perseverance is a good quality, uh, character quality to develop and in the end everything looks really, really nice. It's the home, the school and the church working together where we will prepare young people to be missionaries, to help join us in issuing the, the kingdom of God but we start right here as our kids learn to be disciples of Jesus. Tuesday, we're going to have the concrete people come and pour the driveway, so we solicit your prayers on that so that driveway is done correctly and that that concrete sets so that we can be ready to go on August 31st.
Amen. The plumbing's coming along well. We pressure test part of this school yesterday. All's going well, and hopefully we'll pressure test the rest of it on Sunday, early Monday, and uh, we'll have water back in the school. Uh, and the, there's going to be a little finalizing of a few other things, bottle fillers coming uh, to be installed later this week. Um, but praise God for all the volunteers. We, we increased from 45 through the morning up to about 70 people in the afternoon. And so I praise the Lord for the help that God sent. Thank you, all of you, for coming out. Thank you for your prayers. I encourage you to be out there tonight for the annual prayer walk. Let us come together and pray for God's blessing upon this school, upon the youth that come, and that they will receive a not only an education for vocation uh, later in years, but an education to serve Christ and the three angels' message taking it forth. So thank you. Our reading from God's Word today <clears throat> is found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 to 22. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verses 15 to 22. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. Oh, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Amen. I invite you to kneel with us as we pray. Dear God, we have come to worship you this morning because we have a hope that even when the scripture that we've just read, that there will be a time of difficulty coming, but we choose to have you be the rock that we will cling to. We come to a God this morning who sees, who hears, who responds to us when we pray, a God who loves us, who defends us, who walks with us through sorrows, through conflicts, through trials. God, we confess that our lives are sinful and that we sometimes are weary of the sin in our lives and sometimes we are not. And so we confess that we need to long to be more like Jesus I think of all the produce that comes from this corner of Southwest Michigan and grateful for the rich harvest, a harvest enough that we can share. And God, why is it that the weeds so easily grow without any cultivation? And it's only when the, the good things come when we work hard for it. So God, I ask that you will take the weeds away from our lives and plant whatever it is that you wish for us to have so that the world will see the beauty of the character of Jesus. Oh, that we could be yours and yours alone and to be yours completely. In our congregation and in our community this week, there have been people who are so sad because someone they love has died. God, may we remember that you are the resurrection and the life. Across this country in the West, there have been fires numerous fires that have had people be evacuated from their homes. Even our Adventist uh, College, PUC, and their schools, people that we know who have had to leave their homes, remind us that this world is not our home. And I ask that you send rain that can put these fires out. And we think of always uh, the COVID situation. God, you were the healer you can stop this plague. 
So I ask that you continue to work with the medical field. And as we are cautious and do all the things within our power to protect, remove fear that people have. God, we are yours. If we get sick, we may get well. If we die, we have a hope that we will see you. So remove the fear from our lives. Across this nation and in our community, some of our schools are starting. There are lines now at the grocery stores and other places because our little Berrien Springs has added people to our community. Protect our schools, protect our children, um, protect our campuses. And in our Adventist schools, parents are entrusting us to help them to know Jesus more, for them to be disciples of Jesus. And some of those students will be coming into this congregation where we be a warm and a welcoming place where our young people will see Jesus as the best choice for their life. We have come to worship you. We have come to listen. And so as Pastor Michael brings us your message today, give him boldness and courage to speak the words that you have given him. May we have ears to hear as well. Jesus, you are the blessed rock of ages. We need a rock that we can stand and cling to. So today we hide in you, and that's the safest place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thank you very much for that inspiring special music. Praise the Lord, it's Sabbath, amen? amen. Praise the Lord, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Sabbath. We thank you for the day of rest, and we thank you for the protection that you have given us. As we are going to open your word, may you be among us so that we may learn, retain, and apply this knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I was looking at the hands of the clock, as I was back there, I was thinking, how is it possible that an African preacher like me who will speak for 30 minutes, it is almost like an introduction to a two-hour presentation as we always do at home. But my prayer is God will hold the hands of the clock or he will help the preacher, amen? Amen. So we'll do the best that we can with the amount of time that God has given us. So let us open our Bibles to the book of First uh, Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. The subject title for today is Packing Orders. I am really confident that all of us here believe that Jesus Christ is about to come. And if you read the history when something great was about to happen, the history of the Bible, God gave his people packing orders. If you look at Noah, when Noah was building the ark, and when God was displeased with the people during that time, he said he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And what did God do? God gave Noah a message of packing. He said, go and make an ark and build an ark. And here are the dimensions. Here is what you're going to do. You're going to preach to the people whilst you're building the ark, and you're going to proclaim the message and invite them to the gospel, but at the same time building the ark. But when people didn't understand and people didn't listen and people didn't want to obey God, God gave Noah the order to get into the ark with all the animals. And if you remember in the times of Sodom and Gomorrah, God said to Lot through those angels, tonight you're going to go out of this city because the wickedness of the city has come to the fullness of the cup of indignation and Lot was supposed to go to go out. Of course, God gave him time to go and minister to his sons-in-laws and daughters that were not with him, and they also refused. And God gave Noah packing orders to get out of the city because God was going to, was going to destroy it. So if you see and look at all these accounts, God does anything, God does nothing without telling his servants the prophets. You find this verse in Amos chapter 5. Verse 7. So we believe that God has given us prophecy, and God has given us the Bible, and he has given us also the lesser light, which is the spirit of prophecy. So let's see what the servant of God says unto, unto God's church in these last days. If you go to the book, um, Last Day Events, page 95, paragraph 2, paragraph 3, and paragraph 4, the pen of inspiration says here, out of the cities is my message at this time. Be assured that the call is for our people to locate miles away from the large cities. One look at San Francisco as it is today would speak to your intelligent minds, showing you the necessity of getting out of the cities. But if you look at the quotation, she was referring to San Francisco at that time in the 1800s and in early 1900s. If you look at the cities now, they're worse than they were back then. And she goes on to say, the Lord calls for his people to locate away from the cities, for in such an hour as ye think not, fire and brimstone will be rained from heaven upon these cities, proportionate to their sins will be their visitation. When, the, when one city is destroyed, let not our people regard this matter as a light affair and think that they may, if favorable opportunity of offers, build themselves homes in that same destroyed city. Last paragraph. She says, let all who would understand the meaning of these things read the 11th chapter 
of Revelation. Read every verse and learn the things that are yet to take place in the cities. Read also the scenes portrayed in the 18th chapter of the same book. So whilst he, she was talking about leaving the cities, she directs the church to the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel and Revelation. It is, it is my prayer that we as the remnant people of God see the significance of the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Because in these books, she says God gave light to his church upon the things that are that are, are going to come. Even Jesus himself in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, he says these things were given to his angel, and the angel signified them, and the angel gave to John, and these things were supposed to shortly come to pass. So she directs us to the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation and the 18th chapter. So what we are going to do this morning we're going to look at the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation. We don't have time to go to the 18th chapter, even to finish the 11th chapter. So if we do not finish the 11th chapter, I pray that you go home and be like the Bereans who went home and studied what Paul had said to see if it was, if it was true. And if you don't get anything out of this, here is the summary. The things that happened in the 11th chapter of Revelation are going to be repeated. Of course, this prophecy was pointing to a certain specific period of time, but at the same time, these things are going to be repeated at the end of time. So what does the book of Revelation say in the 11th chapter? Let's go there. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So Bible students will agree with me that you cannot start a chapter with end or therefore. It means that there's something that came before that the prophet is, is putting into context here. So if you see Revelation chapter 11, it is supposed to be part of Revelation chapter 10. You know, when the Bible was written, oh, when the Bible was written, it wasn't divided into chapters and into verses. Praise God for chapters and verses because we can reference the Bible and go to the specific verses and chapters easily. But some of the scholars, what they did, they divided this section. Sometimes they just divided in between of a continuing subject. So, Revelation chapter 10, what does it talk about? It is the prophecy that is talking about the great disappointment. And John saw that angel, who is Jesus, by the way, the angel that is referred in this chapter. How do we know that it is Jesus? If we go to the, to the same chapter, chapter 10, verse 1, it describes Jesus the same way, the angel the same way John describes Jesus in chapter 1. Eyes like fire. It says here, I saw another angel, mighty angel, come down from heaven and clothed with a cloud and a rainbow upon his head. His face was, it were the sun and his feet as pillars of, as pillars of fire. The same description that we are given by John in chapter 1, we see the same description here. And also, if you go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, it says here, and I will give power unto my witnesses. So there's no angel that has witnesses. We only know that Jesus is the one who said, you are my witness or you will be my witness into the, into the whole world. So John sees in chapter 10 uh, the angel who is Jesus who had his foot on the bank of the, of, the, of the waters and on the other side on the land, he was holding the small book. Students of prophecy know that that small book was the only sealed portion of the book of Daniel, which talked about the 2300 days. And that book, he was told to go and do what? And eat it. And when he ate it, what happened? It was sweet in the mouth. And what else happened? It was bitter in the, in the belly. And John, I can, just, I can just picture John with my own imagination, you know, when you have a stomach bug and when you have stomach pain, you are subconsciously, you touch your stomach and you, you can fall down if the pain is so severe. I remember when I went to El Salvador last year, my first time going to El Salvador, I enjoyed so much. I ate everything that 
desire in my eyes. I'd never drank coconut water before, and I drank coconut water. I ate pupusas. I ate everything from the market. Lo and behold, when I came back, that same week, guess what happened? I had a stomach bug because I wasn't used to the environment in El Salvador and the food they ate. So it was hard to stand. It was hard to sit. It was hard to eat. It was hard to do everything. So what I was left with to do was to, to lay down. So I'm seeing John in my imagination. The Bible doesn't say that. Maybe John is prostrated on the ground. And the last verse, it, say, it says here, in, in, in the same chapter, in chapter 10, it says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before the main, many nations, uh, tongues, and kings. How can I prophesy when my tummy is hurting, when I'm prostrated on the ground? So this prophecy was referring to the, to the Advent people in the Millerite movement. They were so disappointed. It almost looked like it was impossible for them to proclaim the gospel. But in Revelation chapter, chapter 11, verse 1, the angel, Jesus himself, is saying to his church, Arise. This reminds me of the many, many miracles that Jesus uh, performed in the New Testament. Some of them he would say to the one who didn't walk, Arise. And to some he said, Thy faith has made thee whole. You remember that, that, that man who was at Bethesda, when he heard the voice of God saying, arise and take thy bed and walk, he arose. So I'm pretty confident that the church of God, after the disappointment, it needed faith in him who has power in his word to arise and to proclaim a message. So it is my appeal to you to believe in God's word. When God says, arise and go and proclaim, go. Do not worry about what you don't have. Do not worry about the things that you think you need before you go. Do not worry about being a theologian or having experience of mission work ever before. But I want to tell you when God says arise, his church must arise and take the message to the, to the whole world. Revelation chapter 11 verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. So now we have the context of what is happening. Now... The servant of God is given a reed like unto a road. What does, that, what does this mean, to be given a reed like unto a, unto a road? If you, if you read Cook um, on page 23 and page 24, he says the word reed is kana in Greek. And from it we get our English word canon, which means a rule, a law, and a standard or order of doctrine. A read that was given to John in this verse, it is the law of God. How do we know that it is the law of God? Because the word that was translated is the same word that we get, the word canon. It is the law of God. And the principles of studying the Bible, one thing that, two things that we're going to do in this presentation or in this sermon is to kill two birds with one stone. One, how to study the Bible. And two, the message that God wants us to hear in this message. How to study the Bible when we go to a certain chapter or to a certain verse. If we do not understand what that verse means, we zoom out a little bit and we look at the chapter. And if we still have some things that we want to learn from that verse that we didn't get from that chapter, we look at the surrounding chapters. And if we don't find what we are looking for or the explanation to the satisfaction of our minds and the Spirit of God, we go to the whole entire Bible. And praise the Lord, we have also the spirit of prophecy. If you study the Bible that way, God will for sure give us light as his people. So we zoom out a little bit and go to the same chapter. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, we see that the prophet says, and the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was sin in his temple, the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunders and an earthquake and the great hell. So what was sin? When John saw the temple opened, he saw the veil being opened. And what did he see? He saw the ark of the testament. What is in the ark of the testament? God's Ten Commandments. God's Ten Commandments. He sees God's Ten Commandments in the same chapter. 
So Cook tells us that the word that was translated read or measurement, it is the, it is the canon, the scripture, the law. But to be specific in this chapter contextually, it is talking about the Ten Commandments, the law of God. And he was told to take that read and measure what? He was told to measure the, the temple. And he was also told to measure the, the altar. He was also told to measure the, the people. So what does this mean? Of course, since this was a prophecy, it wasn't referring to the literal temple in Jerusalem. What was it referring to? The other principle that we use in interpreting prophecy is literal local and worldwide spiritual. What happened to the literal Israel, when we apply it to the church of God in these last days, it becomes what? Spiritual. So here the temple that is being referred to is the heavenly sanctuary, not the earthly sanctuary. And now God gives specification. Which part of the heavenly sanctuary is he talking about? He talks about the altar. This gives us a clue which part of the, of the sanctuary. The altar that he's talking about, which one? How many altars were there in the sanctuary, in the literal earthly sanctuary? How many? Two. Which ones were they? The altar of the burnt sacrifice, which was outside in the court, and the outer altar that was in the, in the holy place, which was the altar of the burnt incense. So which one is he talking about? Verse 3, verse 2 t tells us which one is he talking about. Verse 2 says, But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the, unto the Gentiles. So we are not dealing with the outer court. We are dealing with the holy place. So, so this is the altar of the burnt incense. What does the altar of the burnt incense represent? We go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And verse 10, Revelation chapter 6 pictures the cry of the people of God crying. And they said to the Lord, how long shall it be until you avenge the blood of those, of those who are killed or the blood uh, until you avenge the persecution that happened to us? So the altar of incense represents the prayers of the saints. Now, how is it significant to us as a people? He's told to measure the altar, to measure the temple, and the people they're in. The people are all the people that believed in the ministration of Jesus when he was in the holy place. In this context, Jesus is about to go, or Jesus is going into the, into the holy place. We know for sure that Protestantism restored the things of the holy place. We know for sure that Jesus, when he was crucified, he was raised, he went into heavens above and he went into the holy place. Where do we find it? We find it in Revelation chapter 1 when John sees Jesus in the midst of the candlesticks. But because of the darkness that came upon the church, all these things that represented the ministry of Jesus in the holy place were enshrouded with darkness. We're going to talk about it in a little, in a, in a, in a little while here. They were enshrouded in darkness then the Reformation or the Protestant movement came and restored the components that are found in the, in the holy place. Now it had come a time for Jesus to move from the holy place into the, into the most holy place. That's why John is given the message to measure the temple and measure the, the altar. Not all those who say unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So everyone who is going to follow Jesus into the most holy place must be weighed by the law of God. Everyone. So the Protestant churches were supposed to be weighed by the law of God to see if they would follow Jesus into the, into the most holy place. Remember, in Le Leviticus chapter 16, when it was the day of atonement, what would happen to the, to the high priest? The high priest would take the blood that was to atone the sins of the whole nation of Israel. And what would he do? He would move from the outer court into the, into the holy place. And when he passed through the holy place, he did something. What did he do? He took the blood and he stopped right there. So the, the temple of God, I wish I had come with graphics to show you. The, the, the tabernacle, the earthly tabernacle, it was from the, from the east to the west. 
So he would move from the outside, from the altar of burnt sacrifice and to pass through the laver, went into the tabernacle and passed, passed the showbread, the table of showbread, and passed the candlesticks and go and stop at the altar of incense. What did he do? Right there, he put his blood on the altar of incense and then he would take his, the coals out of the altar of incense and put them in the in the censer, and he would put also the incense and go with it into the most holy place, which means the ministration of prayer and the ministration of God's people pleading and connecting to heaven through the medium of prayer would continue even into the holy place. This is the reason why Paul says pray without, without ceasing. This is how we get into the, into the most holy place. And you remember when the probation was closed in Revelation chapter 15, it says no man could enter into the holy place. This could mean two things. This could mean that Jesus himself as our representative and as him who, is, who wears humanity for eternity could not enter into the most holy place because God would put that smoke signifying the close of probation. But at the same time, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is ministering on our behalf. We have our, our high priest who is touched with our grief. The way we enter into the most holy place is through prayer. The pen of inspiration tells us that it is a wonder that when we look upon the earth, when we look upon God's people, they pray so little, yet they need prayer that much. So, it's not only following the high priest into the holy place as we do well in explanation. It's also doing what we are, what we are supposed to do. The sons of Issachar, what were they known for? They knew the times of which we do well as Adventists. We know the times. We can explain the 2300 days. We can explain the 70 weeks. We can explain the 1260 days. We know the time. We can explain what the papacy is doing. We can explain all these things. But how good is it to God's children if we don't know what Israel ought to do? Pecking order number one, we need to be praying to be connected with God, with our Savior Jesus Christ in the, in the most holy place. He goes on to say in verse 2, But the court that was without the temple live out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So who are the Gentiles? The clue, we find it in this very same verse. And the next verse that follows. The Gentiles that are being talked about, skipping a little bit, going further, the, these Gentiles are going to tra tread the holy city under, underfoot. And they're also going to persecute God's two witnesses. And we're given a time period here, 42 months. In prophecy, if we go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 4, it tells us that I have given you a day for a, for a year. So if we unpack those 42 months according to the Jewish calendar, we see that they amount to, to 1,260 days. If you're going to take a day for a year, I'm preaching to the choir. This is an Adventist community, right? But let us refresh. It doesn't hurt to refresh. God's word is anew every day. Now, it, is, it amounts to 1260. This period of time, where, where do we cut it out out of the 2,300 2, days? We go to the same book, Revelation chapter 13, The Deadly Wound. That is the end of this, prophet, of this time period, which is when the beast when the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 was wounded. And for sure, if you're a student of prophecy, you know that that happened in 1798 when Bethia, the general, went and took Pope, the captive, and they, they stripped the papacy, their civil power. So now, if we back 1,260 years, we go to 538 A.D., 
But so many scholars, they accuse us or they say, you Adventists, you just found this date because you back from 1260, from, five, from 1798, and then you found this date. Because for so long we've been using an approach that was more military. What do I mean that, by that? Because we used the Ostrogoths war with, the, with, the, with, with, the Rome, with Rome to... To, to actually say 538 is our mark or is our date for starting the 1260 days. But I want to tell you this, if you go to the book, of, uh, the book Great Controversy, the pen of inspiration takes us on a different lens. She said, in the 6th century, the dragon gave power to the beast. So we go back into the history and see what happened in 538. That is when the Bishop of Rome was given power to be over the whole Christian world. So this is what happened in 538. This uh, Justinian code, which was given in 534, didn't come into practice until 538. So which power during this period is referred to as the Gentiles? It's the Catholic system. Is the power that we know, the second beast of Revelation, chapter 13. And the Bible goes on to say, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand and two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Same period of time. I will give power unto my witnesses. If you read Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2, we see that the dragon gave power to the beasts. But God did not leave his children alone. He did not leave his children without, without help. At the same time, when the beast was given power by the dragon, God gave also power to his witnesses. And now, so who are these witnesses? Are they two people, his two witnesses? Are they two people who lived during the 1260 days? No. Who are the two witnesses? The Old and the New Testament. How do we find that? Jesus said, you talk about the prophets, you talk about the scriptures, and these scriptures in the book of John, these scriptures testify of me. So the two witnesses are the Old and the, and the New Testament. And they shall persecute these two witnesses during this time. What happened during the Dark Ages? They are called the Dark Ages because the word of God was restricted. But we want to find out what the prophet of God says here. It says here, these witnesses in the same verse, verse 3, they were clothed in sackcloth. What does this mean that they were clothed in sackcloth? It means two things, according to the Bible. If you go in the whole Bible and you search the word sackcloth, the first occurrence that you find is in the book of Genesis when, when Jacob heard or received the news that Joseph was torn and was destroyed and was killed by the beasts of the field. What did he do? He rent his clothes. He put on sackcloth. So sackcloth is a symbol of mourning and pain. And at the same time, sackcloth, Bible scholars agree that sackcloth is also a symbol of obscuring the light. Even if you go to the same account of, um, of Jacob, you see that the reason why he was wearing sackcloth is because he was deceived. He was given false information. But the same concept of obscuring the light, we see that in Revelation chapter 6, when we are told that the sun was turned into, into a circle or was covered by a circle, which is obscuring the light. So the same thing happened during this time. The Christians were persecuted. The wild dances, they ministered or they proclaimed the message from the wilderness. So God's church was given what? Was given power. It says here, God gave power to his two witnesses. Which verse in the Bible, I told you that we're going to kill two birds with one stone. How to study the Bible and at the same time, how we can be able to get the message out of this. Which verse in the Bible 
where Jesus, who is saying, my witnesses, talks about these two words, witness and power. We find that in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. He says, when you shall receive power, you wait for the Holy Spirit. When you shall receive power, and then you will be my, my witness. So in as, far as, in as far as the Bible, the Old and the New Testament are the two witnesses of God, if you have this Bible alone, and it is sitting there without anyone taking it to the nations, it is not a witness. Because it is not speaking. But God, in order for the Bible, the Old and the New Testament to be witnesses, he needs people who are going to witness as well. Amen? So these two witnesses, they also include the people of God. You shall be my witness to the end of the world. And Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness. And then the end will will come. So, what does this mean to us? That the witnesses were given power. We will not have time to, to finish the whole, the whole chapter. But, in verse 4, he says here, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of Israel. We're going to end with this. These are the two olive trees when you hear the olive trees, you just start thinking, where in the Bible do I find the same imagery? You go to the book of Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 7. Zechariah sees the same vision, but he had a message for someone who was leading in the construction of God's people, in the restoration of the temple, by the way, which was destroyed by the Gentiles. So what does the Zechariah say? He saw the two olive trees, and he saw one candle stand. We ha don't have time to go into why he saw one, and in the book of Revelation, there is two. But when you go through that passage, he says, I don't understand what these mean. And the voice that was giving him interpretation, he says, really, you don't understand? And he said, yeah, I don't understand. And he said, this is the word of God unto Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my, but by my spirit. So each time the church of God was about to enter into, into conflict with the enemy, a major conflict with the enemy, God would give it extra power, the outpouring of his spirit. You remember the early church. The early church, God gave it power. Remember the disciples, when they were, when they were at Pentecost, what, what came like cloven tongues, which were like fire, it was the power, the Holy Spirit of God. And even here, when the beginning of the, of the two, 1,260 days, it, it is said here, God gave power to his witnesses. And now, we are told here, in the book of Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 7, it's not by power or not by might, but by my, but by my spirit. So the pen of inspiration in the quotation that we first read, she said, what happened during the dark ages? If we're going to finish, you'll see that the prophecy points to the French Revolution. What happens in, during the French Revolution when the Bible was taken out and persecution was was bloody, it's going to happen again. But what is going to sell people through this whole time is because they are given the Spirit of God. That's why we should be praying for the latter rain. It is not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit. It is not by the PhDs that we have. It's not by our smartness. There are smart engineers among us. There are smart lawyers. There are smart accountants. There are smart. All these things are needed in the church for us to be one body and for us to be doing different things that will advance the cause. But if we stop there and see our capabilities and our ab abilities and think that these are the things that are going to sail us through the time of trouble, of Jacob's trouble, then we are mistaken. The word of God says here, by my spirit. 
We should be praying for the Holy Spirit because the clouds are gathering. Ezekiel says, son of, God, son of man, I have made thee a watchman upon the walls of Zion. If you see a sword coming, you should warn my people and my people should start packing. Those are packing orders. When they start packing and when they get out, then they are delivered. But if you don't blow the trumpet, if anyone perish in the city, their blood I'm going to require upon your hand. So we can see that the clouds are gathering. We can see that the things are happening. We can see all these things that are happening around us. Let us be like the sons of Isaac, which was a small group of people who understood the times and they did not stop there. They knew what Israel was supposed to, to be doing. The pen of inspiration says, out of the cities. The pen of inspiration says, we must be praying for the outpouring of the latter rain and the Holy Spirit. We should depend upon God and we should immerse ourselves into the word of God, which are the two witnesses. And at the end of the chapter, the witnesses that were killed in the streets of France, I don't have time to go through it, everything. They were seen resurrected and they went up to heaven, which means the Bible, after, 17, after, after the, the French Revolution, the Bible started going out again. God's word will not die. It will stand forever. So let us immerse ourselves in the word. Let us listen to the prophets of God. It is now time to pack. It is now time to do what God has said we should do. I know I have taken just a few minutes of the Sabbath school here, but the song that we are going to close with, Onward Christian Soldiers, it says here, Onward Christian Soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before, like a mighty army moves against the foe. Second verse, I love this one. It says, it says like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are trading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all oh, one body we. We are not divided, Oh, one body we, not by women's ordination, not by tithe parity, not by COVID-19. We are not divided. We are one body. But it goes on to say, one in hope of the coming of Christ, one in charity, the love that is among us, us onward Christian soldiers. Crowns and thrones have perished. Kingdoms rise and wend. But the church of Jesus constant will remain because we have Christ on promise, the last verse, it says, Onward, then ye people, join our happy throng. Blend with us your voices in the triumph song, singing glory, praise, and honor unto Christ our King. How are they supposed to come and blend with our voices, yet we are singing all key? Singing glory, praise, and honor unto Christ our King. This, through countless ages, men and angels sing. As we sing this song, let us open our hearts so that God will help us to prepare for his soon coming. Sorry, number 612, Onward Christian Soldiers. Christian soldiers, 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because you give us this promise that we're going to triumph. And Lord, help us to pray for your spirit and soften our hearts so that we will learn, retain, and apply your word. And as we are going into the most difficult times that are ahead of us, may you give us your spirit. We pray for the outpouring of the latter rain. As we go into Sabbath school, may you help us so that we can be able to learn the things that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. We will be starting Sabbath school with a mission segment, so those who would like to stay for that mission segment uh, will stay, and uh, those who need to go to their different classes, you can feel free to go to your different classes.